All right, let's go ahead and get started. Good morning. Um, I'm Sandy Archer. I'm a professor here at the University of Kentucky. And thank you all for joining me and us this morning for this um, uh, conversation and presentation regarding care of the professional voice. Um, all of you that are not from the University of Kentucky, if you want to chat me and let me know where you're from, I'd love to see where you're um, signing in from. That'd be fun. Um, in the meantime, we'll go ahead and get started. So when we talk about the professional voice, um, uh, for me, that includes just about anyone who uses their voice uh, for their occupation. So that could be our educators, uh, lawyers, of course, um, our colleagues, salesmen, and, and like. Um, and then we have our um, our professional uh, singers um, or um, casual singers that occur in a variety of different um, venues uh, with the operatic uh, voice being the most um, trained, well-trained. And those are uh, the people that are just um, really um, astute and accustomed to having perfection in their voice quality. Most of us can accept a little bit of raspiness from time to time, but they're the ones that really require um, almost immediate attention. So most speech abnormalities can be um, diagnosed just by simply listening to the voice. This is where um, I advocate with our residents and, and trainees that um, we kind of sometimes fail in listening to our patients, but this is one of the most important times where we actually have to listen to our patients. And if we give them a chance to speak um, and, and perhaps sing as well, we'll be able to get a better appreciation for the quality of their voice and determine um, just by listening what may be in our differential diagnosis. The mechanisms of speech require integration of um, um, the respiratory, phonatory, and uh, resonance, um, as well as articulation um, that occurs. And that's quite helpful for uh, understanding um, how voice and speech are produced. And pretty much um, preaching to the choir here, but um, we have the three different areas where we see voice production, the pulmonary phase, which is where the um, air comes through to, vi um, to vibrate the vocal folds, and that's the laryngeal phase. And then <clears throat> everything that comes through the, um, the larynx then goes into the oral cavity, and that's where resonance and articulation play a role in terms of uh, producing our voice. So um, air pressure is quite important, and we'll sometimes see um, uh, folks that come in that have very poor quality to their voice, we want to initially determine if they have good breath support or not. And having good breath support allows for um, air flow volumes to go through the vocal folds, which can help with increasing pitch and loudness, especially when the voice has to be um, um, uh, presented across a large area. So again, preaching to the choir, articulation disorders are lip, tongue, um, the dysphonic voice, the weak voice is often from a, a pulmonary standpoint, but hoarseness by definition is really a laryngeal problem. And so anything that um, any um, uh, patient who comes in with uh, their chief complaint of hoarseness, that's where we really wanna focus is what's going on with the laryngeal phase. We often do get patients um, that are usually non-singers that, that come in with voicing issues and those are in a different class and we don't have really the time to discuss all the different causes of hoarseness today. We're gonna to really just focus on uh, the professional voice and going from a healthy voice to a non-healthy voice. So there's a lot of variation that occurs um, in the uh, way the vocal folds connect uh, with them stretching and relaxing and the amount of air that's going through. And these are uh, what differentiate our vocal um, frequencies. Um, there are a few term, uh, ports, points of terminology that I'd like to just mention briefly, because um, when you deal with a, pro, a, a professional singer, especially an operatic singer, uh, but some others as well that are well tuned to their voices, they'll discuss um, what's wrong with their pitch or their loudness or the quality of their voice. And so pitch is really intensity and loudness is the frequency, uh, quality of their voices, the complexity, how they can put everything together. And the flexibility is um, more of the same. So we have a distinction in the quality of the voice and it's based on a gradual transition in the uh, length and the straightening of the vocal folds as we all are aware. When we deal with common medical voice problems in singers, it isn't much different than with um, um, our general population, but singers can certainly, and voice, uh, professional voice users certainly can get acute respiratory tract infections, they can have vocal abuse, 
uh, both acute and chronic based on a poor technique. Um, and even though someone sings, we deal with a lot of beautiful voices in the singing world, but many of them are untrained voices and they know how to deal with them uh, when they're working well, but when they develop a problem, they're pretty lost because they often don't have any um, background with a, a speech language pathologist or a physician to help them through that. And a lot of our singers, especially the, not, um, the less professional ones and voice users, um, try to work through some of their problems um, by talking and singing and performing, and that can only make things a bit worse. So we'll see the vocal abuse can cause an acute laryngitis with just mild swelling and usually is self-limited. Chronic laryngitis occurs with uh, more um, persistent problems with the voice, um, and that can develop into vocal nodules or polyps. And of course, um, we don't see a lot of performers now that smoke, but the smokers that do can certainly have that chronic hyperplastic laryngitis that we're so used to seeing in our uh, non-singing uh, but smoking population. Um, allergies play a role in voice problems, including post-nasal drainage and throat clearing related to that. Uh, laryngopharyngeal reflux is a common problem with everyone and singers are no exception. And then we get into a situation sometimes when there's a muscle tension, dysphonia, which causes the false folds to uh, touch or vibrate. And then we also have a category called hysterical dysphonia, and that's more likely related to um, stage fright and the like. So when we're talking about assessing voicing problems with our singers and voice professionals, we have uh, three groups of people that work with our singers typically. The voice teacher, vocal coach, is the one that worked with the performing voice to uh, work with pitch and breathing techniques. Um, we as otolaryngologists help to diagnose if there is a problem, what that particular problem is from um, evaluating the vocal folds and listening to their voice to determining whether it's a swollen membrane versus a lesion versus a technique issue such as muscle tension dysphonia. And our colleagues in speech language pathology are the ones that help us to deal with um, uh, getting through some of these disorders. And we'll talk more about that in a few minutes. The uh, speech language pathologist uses a variety of different tests and studies. And if you have not had the opportunity of working with a, um, a speech language pathologist that is trained in voice, it's worth spending several hours or a day or two with them in their clinic to see exactly how they do their evaluation from stroboscopy to acoustic analysis. And some even do some um, airway, uh, um, air flow volumes that they can do right in their office. Many of these uh, speech pathologists will also have some musical equipment in the room that they can have um, a performer uh, play and sing. Uh, pianos are the most common um, instrument that's available in the offices, but not every um, speech language pathologist will have that available for them. And that's why it's important to recognize that not all otolaryngologists are um, trained to do professional voice, but it's something that you should consider um, um, when you're going into practice because there's a, such a limitation in how many um, otolaryngologists that do voice are out there in the community. And it's a really great way to build your practice. When a professional singer comes in, they'll often talk about their vocal registers and vocal registers typically are in the chest, the mid voice, which is more in the throat area, the head, and then the falsetto. And we'll talk more about that in a moment too. They'll also discuss what range, <clears throat> you'll wanna ask them what range they typically sing in. And for the male voice, we'll see it from the bass all the way to counter tenor. And in the, in the female voice, we'll see contralto all the way up to uh, the higher pitches of the uh, higher range of the sopranos. There are a few other terminologies that, um, that you might hear from a professional singer describing their voice. One is a pitch break and a pitch. So vocal uh, registers arise from different vibratory patterns that are produced by the vocal folds. And the first of these forms are, are the natural and normal voice and that's called the modal voice. Um, and that were, were pretty much relates to what the normal disposition of the vocal folds um, do with closing. That's kind of also the, what we also uh, discuss in speech language pathology terms as the per patient's um, fundamental frequency. Um, when they um, have a change in their vocal quality in the transition, they can get this pitch break where they just lose sound for a moment or two. And that's usually just a technique issue, but 
in some patients, especially our older patients, we have to consider some neurologic uh, concerns as well. Dampening occurs when the vocal folds are reached the maximum length and tightness, and that's really a squeezing phenomenon. So they're really squeezing the vibration out of their vocal folds, and they have much poor control and a more monotonous sound to their voice. Vocal fry is really at the lowest register when the vocal folds are the most relaxed, and there's air that's floating through them uh, regularly. And this is when um, our singers are truly trying to get their lowest frequency. And if they don't have good control at that point, they'll have this breaking of their voice at the very low um, frequencies. And so as I mentioned earlier, the modal voice register is really um, what we talk about as the main and most usual register for, for folks that are speaking and singing. And the majority of this is done, in, um, of the singing and speaking is done in this register. And as the pitch rises, the vocal folds obviously are lengthened, tension increases, and the vocal edges become thinner. So a well-trained singer or speaker can phonate in up to two octaves or more above what their normal uh, register is. And a well-oiled machine of a singer, especially the operatic singers, can get even much um, more uh, flexibility in their range. The other term that we'll talk about for a moment is just falsetto. And falsetto register is the highest level that someone can sing in. And you'll really only hear about this when you're dealing with uh, uh, very professional operatic type singers. But when they want to get to that very high range, it's usually an octave above their modal range. And so male singers typically will sing in a falsetto to get that higher pitch. And women have that normal higher pitch, so they often don't have to go very false uh, falsetto. So let's talk about um, the workup of a singer um, that has hoarseness problems. And this is no different than any other patient. The history is probably the most important thing that's different when it comes to uh, dealing with singers. And so we have a little checklist here. And this isn't going to be on the handout. My residents have received that already this morning. And this will be posted on the website with the webinar uh, this evening by Sarah Lynn. And um, you'll be able to um, take a chance to look at this and create your own little checklist of what um, you want to ask your singers. For most of our patients, we always ask the standard history, which is um, how long this has been going on, what symptoms preceded um, your issues with your voice. The age of the patient is important because younger patients, they have hormonal changes going through puberty, especially the males. We may see some problems with that at that 13, 14 year old age of boys. Whereas women, when they get premenopausal, they'll have some changes related to hormones as well. Um, one of the more important questions I ask, because this defines the urgency of care, is when their next um, important performance is. And that could be an audition or a full performance. And we want to get our singers or performers um, or our, our professional voice users back to normal voicing and singing as soon as possible. If they have a history of vocal coaching, that usually allows for them to have more understanding of, the, of, the, uh, of their voice. And so we can make some recommendations. I can make some recommendations on things they can do while they're awaiting getting in to see our speech language pathologist. Some professional singers have certain goals that they're trying to achieve, and it's important to try and get on, on, um, on par with them in terms of learning where they want to go with their voices or where they've been with their voices, and that could help you to understand their, um, their needs. Um, type of singing environment. This used to be a lot more important than it is now, simply because just about all the, um, the venues are smoke-free, which has made it much easier for our performers. Um, usually not a problem for gospel and church, not a problem for operatic, but sometimes can be a problem for our rock and, uh, rock and roll, pop, and, um, and uh, rhythm and blues that are playing small clubs that could be somewhat smoky and very dry. So you want to get an idea of what their type of singing environment is. Um, you also want to know what they're doing for rehearsal. Uh, before performances, we want to know what they are doing to prepare for that. And that's important to, um, 
understand that they have to, like um, any good athlete, they have to exercise their instrument before they start to use it. And if they go into a performance with just belting it out, they're going to have some difficulties. So you want to get them to do some sliding scales uh, before some lip thrill exercises, which are basically just uh, humming with their lips together. Mm, that type of thing or the comfortable um, e, e, slowly up, slowly down, holding the note periodically um, so that they can um, in their, um, their uh, pitch control and having them breathe whenever they need to. So those are things that are important for the rehearsals. Similarly, when they're rehearsing, when they're performing, their hydration status is important too. And I don't have that listed here, but that's terribly important in terms of making sure that they're well hydrated before a performance, but not too well hydrated that if they have a long set that they don't have to feel like they have to run to the bathroom. Um, vocal abuse. Um, You'll, my residents hear me frequently tell our, uh, our professional voice users that their speaking voice is their singing voice. So if they're abusing their speaking voice, but taking care with their singing voice, that's probably not a good thing. So we want them to recognize that breath support's important. They want to have good breathing technique, and they want to be able to not um, overuse their speaking voice, especially if they're planning on using their singing voice um, um, in the near future. Of course, we want to know their general health condition as well, and just to help you to determine um, what further recommendations that are necessary. And that includes medications that they take, um, general medical problems. So we've got diabetics. They are um, frequently are um, um, poorly hydrated, so they need to hydrate more because if their sugars are out of control, they're losing um, hydro they're losing fluids in their system. If they've got general medical conditions, they're on a variety of different medications. And I'll discuss that in a few moments. And then certainly lastly, but not uh, least, are what their actual complaints are related to their, um, their voice on the visit that they have with you. They've had an um, antecedent respiratory tract infection that's usually pretty straightforward and that's something that you can work through quite easily with medical management or voice rest. Um, and we want them to really kind of describe their hoarseness to us. And I like them to, um, 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 describe their hoarseness without using the word horse, telling me what their specific quality of the voice is that they're having difficulties. And so do they feel like there's some breathiness if they're um, not able to control their voice over time, um, if they're losing some of the volume and their um, um, uh, projection of their voice. With the pulmonary um, issues, it's all about breath support. If I didn't mention that, there's four more times where I mentioned it on the slide here. But breath support really is important. And, and one of the things that I like to advocate when you're evaluating a, um, a, a professional voice user is just watch them speak. Watch their neck. Watch to see if there's any tension there. And more importantly, watch to see if they're actually taking a breath when they're talking. If they're going run-on sentences and starting to turn blue in the face and their neck is looking very tense, then they certainly are not having good breath support. And these are things that they, you can point out to them right away. And you can even advise them that they can practice in front of a mirror and they'll see what they're doing and they'll soon learn to get um, better breathing technique involved. For us, uh, laryngeal stroboscopy is a key to looking at vocal fold. In the acute setting, it's usually not so critical. But if you've got a, um, a professional um, who has an upcoming engagement and their vocal folds really don't look too badly, the real basic use for me for stroboscopy is seeing if there's an dynamic segment of the vocal fold or if they're squeezing a little too hard that can't be seen on, um, on with the, with the uh, naked eye with a flexible or a mirror examination. And so video strobe really is a very important tool to use in your, um, in your evaluation of a professional voice user, whether it's a, um, a singer or a um, salesman, it doesn't matter. But that can define some of the uh, um, mis minuscule little changes that are occurring on the vocal folds with poor vibration that can't be picked up with the naked eye. And this is what um, basically Please. normal vocal folds should look like. Most all of you have already Go seen video strobes and, Seeing what vocal folds appear. Yeah. 
and you can see the vibration and closure. Men typically have um, a small glottic gap posteriorly and women do not. <gasps> when we look at this, we're looking also at, um, um, and on the, where I've stopped the slide, you can see the infraglottic vibration of the vocal fold coming up. So there are basically two vibrations that occur on the vocal folds, the inferior to superior vibration, and then the posterior to um, anterior vibration on the vocal, uh, on the vocal uh, membrane, which you often cannot see so well on video strobe. Um, we're looking at the general appearance of the vocal folds and the larynx, looking for a particular redness or inflammation that can be occurring from reflux changes, from allergy drainage, um, looking to see if there's any pooling of secretions in and around the airway. And then we want to examine the ventricle, which is nicely seen on this particular view here as well. And you can do that by getting them to sniff while you're doing your examination or re reverse phonation, where you're having them draw in a breath when they're trying to sing like, ee! I call that making them sound like a donkey in heat. He the uh, voice conversation that you have with your patients um, really is about vocal hygiene. We want to teach them that fluid um, takes um, uh, is really terribly important in the uh, vibration of the vocal folds, and so they need to understand that that's probably the most important thing they need to do throughout the day. If they're drinking plenty of fluids but they're caffeinated or alcoholic, those are diuretics, and that could certainly work against them. Um, avoiding the screaming and yelling, cheering. Uh, we can teach, or more importantly, our speech language pathology team can teach anyone to use their diaphragm to project their voice without traumatizing their vocal folds. And this is really important for teachers that are in large classrooms, um, as well as uh, singers that are performing without amplification. We'll also see a lot of singers working with a microphone that still like to scream into the microphone and that's part of their technique or their performances. And so we wanna try and break some of those habits if we can and educate them on the importance of diaphragmatic breathing rather than using their respiratory neck muscles to get their voices out. Every once in a while for operatic singers and not uncommonly with our more casual singers, um, we have smoking as an issue and we wanna again educate them that that is terribly drying and irritating to the vocal folds and the um, up respiratory membranes. And so anything they're smoking or vaping um, is not good for them. And so that's just uh, another public service announcement. If they have a cold respiratory tract infection, we really don't want them to sing or speak through that. So we want limited voice use. And so that's terribly important. When um, you have a performer that has an upcoming performance and they have a bad respiratory tract infection, the worst thing you can do is have them try and perform through that because that could make them uh, traumatize their vocal folds and keep them out of um, further um, performances for weeks to months to come. So that might in fact entail canceling or delaying a performance for them. And that has huge economic um, 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 factors. And so we just have to be very careful when we recommend that. And so it's important that you see these performers and perhaps even see them a, a day or two after you initiate treatments to get them better. Throat clearing and coughing are also very traumatic to the vocal folds. So we wanna um, um, treat the postnasal drainage and the reflux to help prevent um, patients and um, singers from, and voice professionals from clearing their voice. And we do some cough suppression exercises, which is basically when, they, when someone feels a cough coming on, they should take a swallow, preferably with something liquid, but if they don't have anything on hand, they could do a dry swallow to try and squeeze the membranes to um, reduce the sensation and the need to do a cough or throat clear. So managing um, allergies with uh, medications um, are important, but they need to be under your control. There are a lot of over-the-counter medications that people will take that are very drying and irritating. And so it's important to avoid um, using those um, without uh, physician um, supervision. Um, reflux, similarly, I'm a big fan of um, non-medical management of um, 
reflux and more behavioral modifications of reflux. And so all of our folks that come in that have findings that are either subtle for reflux or more overt reflux symptomatology are told about head of bed elevation, are told about avoiding eating or drinking within two to three hours of their bedtime if possible. And that's a little challenging on a performance evening, but it can be easily done through the rest of the week. And we also discuss with them um, <clears throat> limitation to certain food groups, including the acidic foods, the uh, fatty foods, the greasy foods, the spicy food. And um, doing those things will definitely help them in terms of uh, reducing reflux uh, symptomatology. Whereas all the medications that are available currently for reflux only change the acidity, but do not actually stop reflux from occurring, um, laryngopharyngeal reflux from occurring. Um, talking with uh, professional singers about their on and off schedule to allow them to get some degree of voice rest. We rarely use strict voice rest, except um, in patients who have an acute vocal hemorrhage. And so they can limit their vocal use during the day, if possible, to protect their voice if they need to, especially when they have poor technique. Um, avoiding dusty, dry environments, important as well to discuss with them. And that's <clears throat> more about um, our um, higher end um, voice users that are doing a lot of traveling. They're in airplanes that are dry. They're in hotel rooms that are dry. And doing things that can help them to keep hydrated in those situations are clearly very important. And then there are some alternative therapies that are available for muscle tension to allow the <clears throat> vocal folds to relax, and massage is quite good for that as well. And our speech language pathology team will actually initiate some massages on the, on the throats and necks of our patients during therapy to help show them what a difference that'll make in terms of their vocal quality on the spot. So voice therapy can be something as simple as just discussing with the um, voice professional um, what we had just, um, what I just went over in terms of just good vocal care and hygiene. <clears throat> we definitely want to have our entire team of voice therapists and vocal coaches in line with the um, professional voice users' needs and goals. And so if they want to be successful, they have to completely understand where we're coming from and what we are advising them. And so that will sometimes include telling someone with an untrained voice um, that they need to seek out a vocal coach. And usually in your, or in your um, region, you'll find a school that has lessons that are reasonably priced or more professional vocal coaches, depending on the circumstances, and they can be tapped into. And if you've been in practice for a while, you've got a list of people you can send them to that can work with them on, um, on their vocal um, control. And with proper motivation and proper care, they can see changes in their voice that are even more dramatic than what they expected. And um, so those are things that are terribly important. Uh, the um, <clears throat> the um, therapies that we do are really up to our speech language pathologist. Um, for me, I will go over some basic techniques with my patients while they're, or, uh, voice professionals when they're in the office, just to get them to be able to relax their larynx um, until they get that appointment with our speech language pathology team. But our voice, uh, our speech language pathologists are a critical part of our um, of our care for our patients that have professional voice issues, and they will do all sorts of different exercises and techniques to help them build their voices um, to a level beyond what they would expect. So what about medical management then? <clears throat> well, um, the proper technique is taught by our vocal coaches and our, our, our vocal professionals. And for the speaking voice, it's just more about the breathing. For the singing voice, it's about maintaining pitch control and breathing techniques as well. Um, I can't say enough about hydration, so let me mention it again. And then if they do develop some kind of uh, problems, we wanna make sure that they're medically treated early on. So um, there are a whole host of medications that are not really beneficial. So I'd like to go over uh, some of the common ailments and then, we'll go over, uh, then I'll go over some of the medications that patients may take that are acceptable and not so acceptable. 
So for someone who comes in with an acute vocal ailment, that's usually within uh, five to seven days of voicing issues. We have the acute laryngitis that can be related to just um, screaming and yelling versus a mild respiratory tract infection, a virus. Um, we can see um, overuse of the voice causing a vocal hemorrhage. Um, stage fright where they're not really a very well-trained voice and they start getting pitch breaks when they first start singing. And that can be managed with uh, beta blockers very nicely. And then the muscle tension dysphonia, which is where they start to use their neck muscles to get their voice out because they're not properly breathing and they're not using their diaphragm to get their um, uh, pulmonary airflow out. And so I think that um, um, MTD isn't as common for the acute ailments as it is for the chronic ailments. And here's an example of a patient who's got um, some, some people would call these pre-nodules or early nodules. You'll see where the ends are there. This slide is really more um, in line with looking at the um, vasculectasias that's present on the vocal folds. And invariably, um, you'll see here, right in this area here, that you'll see it, this is the vertical portion of the uh, ectasia, and then there's almost always a horizontal going to the edge of the vocal fold, and that typically goes to where the pathology is. It isn't as evident on this one as it is here, but you can see that this is some hypervascularity related to vocal uh, function issues. Chronic vocal ailments are, are much more concerning, and they're not common in operatic singers, but they can occur, but they're more common in um, other forms of singing, our rhythm and blues, our pop, our country, and especially our gospel singers who have a really um, intense vocal demands for a very short period of time and are often educated on how to sing by a choir director that doesn't have a lot of formal vocal training. And I like to tell my gospel singers that the goal of gospel singing is to be loud and proud, louder and prouder than the church two miles down the street. And I think they get a pretty good kick out of that because they realize that that's not uncommon. Um, so we'll see vocal nodules or polyps or cysts, rarely vocal granulomas, often related to reflux, and then again, the muscle tension dysphonia. So here we see, um, oh, sorry about that. Here we see an early polypoid uh, development here. This is from direct vocal trauma. And you're seeing a unilateral, and there's just a little area of irritation on the opposite edge, which is probably would go away with this being cleared up. These early polyps will certainly cause a um, breathiness to the vocal folds, um, uh, vocal fold closure, because they'll have early contact at that point, and so they'll have an anterior posterior gap. <clears throat> These are sometimes managed, can be managed with uh, steroids and vocal um, exercises, but frequently when the polyp, when a unilateral polyp is there, it often has to be excised. Here are early nodules. And you may not see this that well. We'll see some swelling of the anterior mid vocal folds at one third, two thirds here, right there. You'll see the swelling there. And that's causing a posterior glottic gap there, what we call an hourglass closure. So there's a gap posteriorly, there's a gap anteriorly there. Here are more mature nodules. These occur more in chronic vocal abuse. And you can see there are nice small points there. And again, you get that hourglass closure. And vocal nodules are primarily managed by our speech language pathology team. They can do some exercises with them that will allow them to um, soften the nodules and, um, and uh, smooth them out. And we rarely offer surgical intervention for vocal nodules acutely. And th that's really only saved for patients who really cannot clear their vocal nodules um, despite aggressive speech management, medical management. Um, I also would go out on a line and say that I would never operate on a child with vocal nodules, period, because they don't follow directions well and they'll get back into the bad habits of screaming. We call vocal nodules in kids screamers nodules and in, in adults singers nodules, 
but it's pretty much the same thing. And so if they're going to go back and continue to do poor focal behaviors, um, if you operate on them, they'll develop a small scar there that if they continue to do those behaviors can uh, form a larger scar and, and affect their voice permanently. This one here is a patient with a vocal cyst. And you'll see it's unilateral and it's ovoid. And you can see that there's just a little different coloration to the vocal fold at that point. And again, an hourglass appearance, so they will have a breathiness to their voice as well. So let's talk about medications and other issues um, related to that. One thing that's frequently overlooked is um, hormonal effects on the vocal folds. Uh, during the menstrual cycle, the progesterone levels are high. Um, that increases vascularity and can um, cause um, vocal hemorrhage. Um, back in the um, early days of opera, um, the um, um, divas would not be allowed to perform during their menstrual cycles. And so the performances would be set by those um, divas as to when they could perform and when they had a week off where they'd rest their voice during that, uh, those circumstances. During pregnancy, similarly, the hormone changes, especially the progesterone levels are quite high, especially in the third trimester. And the, again, it's a very vascular hormone and can cause problems. Progesterone also is metabolized in the female body to testosterone, which masculinizes, masculinizes the voice. So if you've got someone who's a performer or singer and they're recently put on hormonal therapies uh, for either uh, uh, um, um, uh, hormone-related issues from breast cancer on to um, aging changes, you need to be careful to um, discuss with them the effects that can occur with um, progesterone. And estrogen is a drying hormone, and so they need to hydrate well when they're taking that. And I never, ever change female hormones in my patients. I just recommend they have those conversations with their gynecologist and see if they can get a lower dose or get off a certain dose. Anabolic steroids similarly will cause vocal issues and can cause increased risk of vocal hemorrhage. Environmental factors are important to discuss with our, our um, performers as well. And so if we've got a performer that's on a plane a lot or in, um, hotel rooms, I usually advocate that they get their water bottle filled, especially right after they go through TSA and have that on the plane because they don't often get enough hydration with just the stewardesses uh, supplying water. Um, and in the hotel rooms, I have them um, travel with some pie tins and have them put some simple pie tins in the corner of the rooms filled with water as a cheap, um, down and dirty, easy little humidifier for their uh, hotel rooms. Uh, noise pollution is just when they're trying to talk over a lot of background noise. Um, that goes back to their speaking voices, their singing voice. So if they're in restaurants or bars and they're trying to talk with other people, they can cause some damage to their vocal folds without realizing it. Again, substance abuse we mentioned earlier with smoking having effects on the vocal folds that are what we're all well aware of. Alcohol is a diuretic, so it's a drying agent. There are certain medications that should, can and can't be taken. And so in general, there are certain medications that are um, um, by, by group, uh, certainly allowed antibiotics, mucolytic agents, uh, decongestants are fine in limited quantities. Um, acetaminophen, some of the nasal sprays in limited quantities as well. The nasal steroid sprays are safe to use and the uh, reflux medications um, are safe to use as well. Um, there are limitations on what we can and can't control. If someone has asthma, they certainly need to be on their oral inhalers, but they need to learn how to use a spacer and rinse their mouth afterwards. Cough suppressants really should be um, avoided if possible, but if necessary, can be used in limited. Uh, uh, Non-steroidals um, can cause bleeding issues, theoretically. And so if you've got a singer, um, you don't want them to necessarily be on uh, non-steroidals for long periods of time for fear of developing a vocal hemorrhage. And that, again, is more theoretical than practical. Beta blockers we use um, for uh, the stage fright and the vocal fry that occurs on um, initiation of the speech. Um, and those can be used um, fairly safely. 
All the sedatives and tranquilizers have anticholinergic properties, so they are drying as well as the antidepressants. So if patients are on those, they just need to be understanding uh, increased hydration is critical. We want to try and avoid antihistamines, diuretics, if possible, because they do dry patients out. But if they are on them for other causes, uh, for other medical reasons, rather, then they just need to hydrate well. Um, I'm just going to slip through these pretty quickly. We all know about antihistamines, cough preparations as well. We talked a bit about the hormonal therapy earlier. Beta blockers do help in getting patients through that initial stress and anxiety when they're early on in their careers. And so 10 or 20 milligrams of propranolol uh, about an hour before their start of their presentation for um, speakers and for singing, um, it really helps to help avoid that vocal pitch break that occurs initially with the onset of, uh, of performance. Again, the sedatives, tranquilizers, dry people out. Same thing with the antidepressants. And then there are certain surgical issues that, um, that uh, voice professionals will come in and say, you know, you've got a patient who's had 10 uh, strep infections in the last year and they're a voice professional. Should you recommend getting their tonsils out or not? Well, there could be scarring that can form. And so if you are cognizant of that, then you wanna do what I call a mucosal sparing tonsillectomy, so you want to leave as much of the mucosa alone and really try and, um, and scoop out that tonsil without um, distorting any more of the normal anatomy. And that usually serves a very nice purpose. I did a study years ago um, with um, our speech-language pathology team looking at pre- and post-op tonsil patients and actually found that most of the patients that um, underwent tonsillectomy had increased resonance of their voice postoperatively. Um, and none had a decrease in their vocal function uh, postoperatively of the singers that we did our, um, um, our um, singers tonsillectomy on. And so they need to be aware, but not all um, ear, nose, and throat doctors are aware of that. And so you just want to be cautious in recommending that they have their tonsils removed by someone who's, um, who takes care of singers and understands the problem. Nasal and sinus surgery is quite valuable because it does also improve the resonance and quality of the voice. I usually do not have my, um, um, my voice professionals go back to um, regular activities for three weeks after having nasal sinus surgery or tonsil surgery. And at that point, when they start back, then they can do some vibratory exercises to get them back in, um, into, their, um, into their regular training mode. And that usually will um, give them a much better voice. Um, some of my most successful singers have had nasal and sinus surgery and have really noticed a huge difference in their vocal resonance and their flexibility and variability of their voice quality. Sleep apnea surgery can also be successfully done, but you've got to be quite careful in doing any palatal work that can cause a velopharyngeal incompetence, which can cause resonance issues. So in these cases, you want to be very careful in doing the nasal surgery, uh, the tonsil surgery and limited palatal surgery. Um, and so we recommend obviously doing the other things, which is head to bed elevation, weight loss. And that's easier sometimes said than done. In fact, it's more easier said than done. I also provide my uh, professional voice users that are undergoing general anesthesia, a list of things that they can give to their anesthesiologists. Um, the anesthesiologists typically are not very happy with my letter to them but I do indicate that um, they need to be quite careful in terms of intubating. And we've all been in the operating room where an anesthesia person of some variety has jammed a tube in, often without actually seeing the vocal, uh, the glottis, and just seeing an epiglottis and traumatizing the vocal folds. And when you're starting to see a lot of blood, and so normally I'll recommend that they use a smaller size endotracheal tube. They need to visualize the glottis before introducing the vocal, um, the endotracheal tube. And then when they, uh, and I always give them steroids preoperatively for a variety of reasons, but especially our singers, they need to get those about uh, 45 minutes to an hour before. Some of them will require anti-reflux medications as well. And then I always advocate in these folks, if possible, a deep extubation so they don't wake up fighting the tube that can cause vocal trauma.
So the treatment for most of the things that we do are um, educating our patients, our, our voice professionals on uh, care of their voice, medical management of any vocal issues um, caused by allergies, reflux, and the like. Um, utilizing our speech language pathologists um, early on in their care to teach them proper um, technique to avoid trauma, and if necessary, arranging for them to work with a vocal coach. And some of our teachers enjoy doing that, even though they're not singers, because they learn that breath support, the diaphragmatic breathing, the muscle relaxation, and they have much better control for projecting their voice across a classroom. So there are certain things that, um, that I advocate again for my, um, as a final step in, in our conversation on voice with our uh, professional voice. And these are the do's and don'ts um, I think we've mentioned, I mentioned a few times hydrate. Well, let's do it again. Avoiding the irritants. Resting your voice periodically is not a bad idea. If they need to, using a humidifier in their bedroom um, to keep them moist when the airs are very dry. Uh, voice professionals, both singers and speakers, really need to do their warm up and cool down exercises uh, to help them to stretch those uh, laryngeal muscles so that they can perform better and develop some stress management techniques and strategies so that they're not really squeezing at their neck. Whispering is bad, yelling is bad, and throat clearing is bad. And so we usually advocate again to um, avoid whispering if they need to talk, talk in a lower volume, but not in a whisper. Um, again, um, learning how to use the diaphragm can project the voice so they don't have to be yelling or screaming. And then the throat clearing with use of um, uh, throat clearing exercises, cough suppression exercises, which is that recommendation for swallowing when they feel a throat clear or a cough coming on. So in summary, the speaking voice is the singing voice. And so we really want to advocate that to our patients, um, that they need to take care of their speaking voice to help protect their singing voice or their professional voice. And so with the, finally, the singer's needs really are in the individualized the speaker's voices are individualized as well. And you wanna partner with a vocal coach or a speech language pathologist to help them take care of themselves. So with that in mind, we just need to have a nice rapport. You'll get phone calls um, with, your, um, with your voice professionals throughout the year from whatever venue they're in. I get calls from all over the world from some of my singers that I take care of asking for advice and recommendations and medications. So I think that's terribly important to, um, um, to know. So with that in mind, I think we've got 10 minutes or so uh, for questions and answers. So I'll be more than glad to, um, let's see here how I can get up my uh, chats here. So if you've got something you wanna bring up on question and answer or a chat, feel free to do so. And I'll see if I can answer that for you. And again, for those who have just joined us, um, if you'd like to send me just um, a simple chat of where you're um, uh, coming from. Um, so it's always exciting to see um, what, um, where people are. I know where my residents are supposed to be anyway. And um, greetings to the Philippines, thank you. The view we have from behind me is just a lily pond in uh, Southern California, very serene. That is not where I am right now. I'm locked in my office just like everyone else. All right. All right, so let me, um, first question is how do you build a practice of, of professional singers? Well, it depends on where you are. If you're in a big city, there's gonna be a lot of professional singers there. And so there's a lot more um, 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 need, if you will. Lexington, we don't have a large number of professional singers here. We have a, a very big opera program, so that's where I've gotten involved. And we have country and western here, gospel. And so the first thing you want to do is you want to understand how to manage a professional voice and have the time in your practice. But one of the most important things is, is be able to get these folks in right away to your office. If they're having a voice problem, they have an upcoming performance, they don't want to get an appointment in three weeks or four weeks. And so if you're one of the few people that'll take care of a voice professional and have availability to get them in right away that day or at worst the next day or two, that's the quickest way to, to develop that practice. 
You can contact your local venues, send a couple of business cards over and tell them you'll be glad to see some of their performers if they're having issues. Um, and that's always a great way to build your practice. Send your card and a note to choir directors of the bigger churches. Um, any voice programs that are in the area, send them your cards and letters too to let them know that you're doing voice care and you'll be glad to hear, um, um, hear from them and hear from their students and their uh, voice professionals. Also, if you can, give a lecture or two so you, to your voice professionals in the area. They may have um, an opera program or a singing program or a church that you can go to, a rotary club, to just talk about just general care of the voice, primarily discussing how to properly maintain the voice. Hydration, vocal exercises, warming up and cooling down. Another question is maximum period of voice therapy before surgical management. That's, that's also a great question. Um, <clears throat> there, each, each problem has their own issues. For vocal nodules, I'd say a minimum of three months of good vocal therapy with a, with a speech language pathologist who takes care of the professional voice is important, but the, the um, vocal professional has to be doing their exercises for it to count. So you can't get someone who comes in with vocal nodules, does one or two sessions, then comes back to you and says, I want surgery. That can be done, but they have to understand that if you operate and you remove the nodules, um, that can cause problems. There will always be a scar, and if you can't do the exercises after you do the surgery, they may have further problems. So part of the speech therapy is teaching folks how to take care of their vocal folds, but also is useful in a post-operative setting to help them get back to more normal um, vibration of their vocal edges. Um, the, the most, um, <clears throat> the most um, um, advertised example of that was Julie Andrews, who underwent vocal nodule surgery by a very prominent otolaryngologist who specialized in professional voice. And she described what a devastating effect that had on her. In reality, she didn't do any vocal exercises postoperatively. And when, after seeing several other otolaryngologists for the same problem after surgery, she was put on exercises, her voice returned completely, and she made a formal apology to the speech language pathology team <clears throat> and her otolaryngologist, um, explaining she really didn't understand what went into the uh, care and treatment of a vocal nodule. So usually we'll say six weeks to, th um, to three months minimum, of vocal therapy before I consider it. The other limitation is in their insurances. Some insurance carriers will only cover a certain number of speech um, language pathology visits. And so that'll play a role in how you can manage them as well. Um, I'd like um, Lauren, um, one of our speech language pathologists is online and I'd love for her to comment, feel free to Put in your two cents here, Lauren. Let's see if I can figure out how to unmute you, then I can... Um... Can you hear me? Yes. Cool. Um, so just a couple of things that I wanted to quickly um, talk about, especially with the residents, um, because I don't know how much you guys see of this, um, just seeing the patients pretty quickly. Um, but something that we see a lot more on the rehabilitation side, because we're spending a lot more time with these patients, um, is definitely the stigma behind having a voice issue as a singer. Um, and then also just how much of a psychological game it is to get back to, you know, full singing and um, voice use. Um, something I've seen clinically and also experienced personally. Um, so um, when you're encountering these patients, I think just a good idea of going into it would just be really having your counseling skills on point and maybe using a little bit more grace with these patients. There's a lot of fear. Um, there's a lot of anxiety coming into this. Um, and so I think just, you know, kind of having that at the back of your mind is something that could be really helpful. Does anyone have any questions for Lauren? Lauren is one of our 
um, uh, speech language pathologist who's been working with me on the professional voice of the last uh, several months. And she um, is very attuned to this. Um, we also have one of my colleagues who also does voice, Dr. Mark Fritz on the line here. And if you have any questions for him, feel free to ask as well. If not, then we'll go ahead and get finished here. I want to thank everybody for um, attending this uh, conversation on care of the professional voice. And thank you all for coming and have a great day.